Tethered Nation, you've often heard me talk about Tethered and their saddle setups and how much I love them and that the, I've given them credit for helping me expedite my learning curve or becoming a more mobile and more aggressive hunter, especially whenever it comes to doing out-of-state hunts. Well, their previous saddle setup, was, there's nothing wrong with it. I've used it for two years, but they've decided to up their game, if you've not heard, and have released the Phantom Saddle. And the thing that they've updated this is, is sizing. Oftentimes, people are asking what size they need to buy based on their waist size. Well, they've kind of eliminated that and created a one-size-fits-most uh, saddle size, which is a tw- for, goes from a 28-inch waist to a 40-inch uh, waist. They developed comfort channels. One of the biggest things people would talk about is just like overall comfort when they get into the saddle. The saddle is comfortable to begin with, but how could they increase that even more? So what they did is they created comfort channels on the uh, loop in which the bridge kind of connects into. And your bridge position will have a lot to do with uh, how comfortable your sit might be because it's going to determine where the pressure of your saddle is being placed on your body. So if you need a little bit more back pressure, you move it to the higher comfort channel. If you need a little bit more pressure or support underneath your rear end, you move it to a lower comfort channel. The other thing, one of the biggest things I think, you know, overall is, you know, that has to do with comfort is how high you're setting your tether. And a lot of times when you're getting into a tree, depending on the size of the tree, where the branches are, things of that nature, you can't always get your tether height exactly where you want it to be. For me, I like to set mine right about neck height. But if I have a branch that's in the way and I'm hunting public ground and I can't cut it, I might need to set it higher or lower. And that's going to impact the length of my bridge uh, away from me essentially, or the, or the distance from me to my tether. And the only way I can adjust that is by having an adjustable bridge and tether has created the utility bridge, which allows you to make that adjustment on the fly, super easy to kind of adjust that length to the optimum position for you to have the most comfort. The other thing that I'm really stoked about that is probably a little bit underlooked is the lineman loops. Now their lineman loops on the mantis are fine, but they're not as rigid as the ones on the Phantom Saddle are. And the reason why they're a little bit more rigid and bigger on the Phantom Saddle is that it's a lot easier to find them whenever you're trying to, you know, ascend or descend in the dark. So for all these reasons, if you've not checked out Tethered, I would go to tetherednation.com, check out their saddle gear, and specifically take a look at the Phantom Saddle. The first thing I do in the morning before a hunt, before a scout, or just before getting ready for work is have my morning coffee. And I'm sure most of you out there listening are the same. Make sure you're filling your mug with Skull Brew Coffee as it is the only coffee company that is both 2% for conservation certified and donates 10% of its profits to conservation organizations to help secure the future of our wild places. So head to SkullBrewCoffee.com and choose between three killer roasts of coffee and know that you are supporting conservation with every sip. Welcome to the Truth From A Stand Deer Hunting Podcast brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you are listening to episode number 173. Today I'm joined by my buddy, Brian Broderick, owner of Day 6 Specialized Gear, and we are talking about finding big bucks in ugly places. So stay tuned. All right, all right, all right. What is going on out there? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you're doing well. Hope you are feeling fine. It's another week in the books here in April. Some of you out there are turkey hunting. Some of us are not. Um, Some folks are are missing turkey hunts due to some travel restrictions. I know our buddy Johnny Utah had uh, had some hunts planned um, to... uh, some extensive kind of turkey hunting that he had uh, had had squashed, and so he's kind of re reworking his plan for the uh, for the fall. But I hope everyone's doing well or as well as they can be doing based on their 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 limited ability to travel and get outside and 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 uh, and visit with folks and stuff like that. Uh, this past holiday weekend, of course, is usually a time where people get together and hang out with family, and I know that that was a little bit limited. But I'm hoping that everyone out there was able to make the uh, able to make the best of it, at least here in in PA where I'm at. At least the weather was nice, uh, which was which was good. Um, I was actually able to get out and do a little bit of scouting. I think that's the one thing here, man, is that you know the weekends, you know, this time of year sometimes get a little, you know, a little crazy with you know yard work and um, trying to catch up on things, you know, around the house and stuff like that. And really, this year it's not really not been the case for me. Um, just you know, given the fact that some of the stuff that I wanted to do, um, you know, to the, to the house outside. I'm just not able to able to do given the the restrictions that we have, whether it's, you know, bring people in to do some stuff or whether it was me, you know, going to the store and being able to pick some things up to to do a few things around the house. So with that, you know, I'm actually spending probably more time scouting this year than I was 
than I was anticipating. So much so to the point that you know I've I, I've hit pretty much every public piece um, that is within you know a, a, what I'll say um, an easy drive of of my home. There's some public that's a little further away that I'm going to have to start venturing to because this past weekend I hit one last piece um, that was you know maybe. 30 ish minutes from my house is kind of like the, the ring that I kind of put around my home. It's like, let me figure out where all the public is not figure out, but let me outline where all the public is, you know, within 30 minutes of my house and those places I want to prioritize getting to this year. Cause those are places I can get to for some, um, I don't want to say easy hunts, but you know, they're, they're easily accessible. It's like, I don't have to spend a lot of time planning to go do it. I can do it on a Saturday. I can have a bunch of different spots kind of mapped out that, either I like or prioritize them on, you know, value as, you know, give them a value rating, if you will, that this is a high value place versus a low value place and hunt those accordingly based on the wind and the weather and, and, and all those kind of things that we look at to determine where we're going to go hunt for a day. And so my goal really was to try to have as many setups as I, or not setups. Cause you know, I, I, I don't really go in with a setup particularly in mind. I'll go in with a, an area in mind of interest, if, you know, I guess is a better way to look at it. Um, but I wanted to have a bunch of public around me kind of mapped out to where I knew where the, the value spots for me were going to be on each, on each piece. Um, you know, and in some places, you know, going back to last year, I know there's a couple places that I liked from last year that I think will probably be decent again this year. Just, it'll take me hanging some cameras and kind of assessing it during the course of, you know, September, late September, early October and figuring out if it's still going to be valuable or not. Um, but I wanted to kind of expand that because I ran into some stuff last year with, you know, some small game hunters and stuff like that. And so I really wanted to try to find some, you know, bigger woods, tougher access kind of areas, um, that would maybe not be as susceptible to, you know, small game pressure, um, and, and, and just act, you know, access in general for the, the normal, you know, archery hunting population in, in the area that I live. Um, and so I've kind of done that and I know I've talked about it before, some of the mountaintop swamps and stuff like that, that I found. And so yesterday was kind of going to the last piece of public in this general area. You know, there was a couple of chunks of public in this one vicinity, um, that I wanted to kind of hit because, you know, I can bounce between them even on a hunt where I maybe drive in on a Saturday morning and there, maybe there's some trucks there or, or maybe I do a quick walk and like the sign just isn't what I need it to be. And so it's easy for me to drive 10 minutes to the next spot and kind of, you know, start over and, and, and check that spot out and see if that's an area that I want to hunt. So that was really what part of the plan was for this year. And then I had one more piece of public to check out. So I went and checked that out yesterday. Unfortunately, you know, I don't think it's going to be, um, a great spot. I found a little bit of sign. There was a body of water, you know, that's kind of been my, um, my MO for this year is like, I've been kind of really kind of prioritizing water, um, knowing that, you know, Greg and I've talked about it, you know, in, in the past, that water is cover and, you know, where there's water, it's usually a little more gnarly and sometimes a little harder to access and which can kind of keep the area clean from, from pressure in general. So, you know, same kind of, same kind of thing, uh, this past weekend as I prioritized that water, um, didn't find anything great around it. There was a couple, you know, habitat updates that the, that, that the, uh, game commission had done on this piece. And that was actually where I found the, the, the best sign. Now, unfortunately, I think it's, it's going to be the easiest to, um, the easiest to access. Um, but in looking at it, when I scouted through it, cause just cause I was curious to see what, you know, what would be in those areas, I didn't find any, any human sign really. Um, I also didn't find any old old tree stands. I think this is one of those unique places that might be a little overlooked because it is relatively close to some houses. So, you know, gun hunting, I don't think is a, an option. So I don't think it really gets hit during rifle season. Also, the habitat work that they did, they just made basically a shit mess of this place. And there's, it looks like there's some food in there. I couldn't tell, you know, what food it, what food it was, but it looks like it's some type of perennial, um, uh, it, it plot that they put in there to, to some degree. Um, but there really aren't any convenient trees to get into in, in that particular area. And, you know, definitely not trees that you would be able to get a tree stand into. I mean, you'd have to back off pretty far to get to a spot to where, um, you could get a, get a tree stand in. So I feel like with a saddle, you know, I'd have some options. Maybe I even think with the saddle options are going to be extremely limited in this particular spot. And so I really think, again, as I've been talking about all year, it's like being multi or all off season so far as being multiple. It's like having the saddle as I walk in, I can get into a tree if I need to. And then also being prepared and not that you need a ghillie jacket or anything like that, but I, you know, have been working on mine and kind of dialing mine in, um, for this season 
because you know hunting from the ground is something I'm going to be adding as I've talked about for this specific reason. I think that your best opportunity to hunt this particular area uh, is probably going to be from the ground. I think you know some tree setups are going to be really difficult to come by in this in this particular spot. And I think in many cases, at least where I had had seen the best sign, you know, whether it was scrapes or rubs, and I did find a couple scrapes in this area that was back in the cover. Um, where those scrapes are at, there is not a tree to, tree to be had to get into. Um, and so I kind of really like that about this spot. So it's not one of those areas that I would call like a high value or a high priority opportunity for me. I think the way I'll probably use this overall um, section of public is probably going to be as a burner a burner spot. Um, you know, I'm likely going to use it probably on days where, you know, maybe the, the weather isn't right or the wind isn't right for some of my other areas or some of my other setups. Um, and, and use this spot as a place that I just want to want to get out and who knows, you know, it's like, it, it may end up being decent and, and, it, and it may not, but you know, I'm probably not going to put a lot of eggs in that basket. Uh, so to speak, I'll probably hang a camera on one of those two scrapes, um, just to kind of monitor it because you never know, um, what's happening. You know, you might have a, a good deer come through. So that was the one setup on this piece that I was, I was looking at it going, mm, you know, maybe I'll hunt this. There's also a pipeline that kind of runs on it as well. And that pipeline in the one area is really kind of overgrown. Um, and actually it kind of, there wasn't any buck sign in there, but it was just really convenient pinch points. Um, definitely if you were looking to put a, put some dough meat in the freezer, I think that would be a, a, a decent setup for that. There was one other setup for, for bucks that I might use on this property. Again, I don't think it's high value. It's right on the edge of the swamp. It's this little finger that kind of goes out into the swamp. I walked that out and there were some really good historical rubs, one or two that looked to be from this past season, but they weren't incredibly tall and weren't incredibly, incredibly impressive. I think this is probably a spot that gets hit year over year as you know, indicated by the sign, um, by the bucks that are in the area. I just didn't see anything that told me that there was anything of um, of significant maturity that would that would trip my trigger and make me want to spend any any amount of time there. Not to mention it's a it's a bitch to get into. Um, and so if I'm gonna <laughs> if I'm gonna put up with that to go into hunt it, it's got to be it's got to be worth my while. Now the only the one kind of positive thing is that the only scrape that I found down around that swamp or down around that water's edge was right outside this area of this little, you know, dry patch that kind of jutted out into the, out into the body of water. And so, you know, I think all things considered, that's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good sign, you know? So it just, again, the scrape wasn't significant. Uh, the rubs weren't significant. Historical sign was significant, but you know, from what I could see from last year, um, just didn't seem to be something that I'd want to, want to prioritize. So that was really my scouting mission for this past weekend. Um, you know, I, it was, I've been doing kind of half days and taking the dog out. So it's like, I think it got about five miles in, uh, five miles in yesterday. And so now I'm going to have to start to turn my attention to some other places. But I think f as far as like this season goes for what I'm going to focus on, I think I'm kind of, I think I'm in a pretty good place. And now the next step will really just kind of be hitting those areas again and getting cameras out here as we get into, um, Later spring, you know, in 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 the summer time frame to start the uh, the the camera um, camera inventory. I think the other thing with at least having you know nice weather and you know being somewhat limited and not being able to do a whole lot is I've been shooting my bow like crazy, like a madman. Um, usually this time of year I start to ratchet up my my bow shooting just in general, um, but this year it's been kind of off the charts. Like I'm literally shooting every day, and the weekends I'm shooting. You know, I don't want to say extensively, but I'm doing more scenario shooting, I guess you could say, uh, which I try to do every year, but usually that, that usually doesn't start to happen until we get into, um, in, you know, the late summer kind of time, time period as we're getting ready for the season, you know? And when I say by scenario shooting, it means, you know, I'm literally shooting up off the ground. I'm in a, you know, I'm in a saddle shooting, um, you know, or in this case for this year, it's like, I'm shooting, wearing a ghillie jacket and shooting. So I'm trying to like, you know, shoot from different angles. I'm trying to shoot from different positions in the yard. I'm trying to shoot from elevated setup wearing a ghillie jacket. I'm trying to shoot in my saddle without a ghillie jacket. I'm shooting, you know, brushed into the, to the, like some of the cedar trees I have in my yard, brushing myself in and shooting from my knees like I would potentially in a ground setup. And so I'm, I'm trying to kind of play all these scenarios out because, you know, 
just because I have the time to right now. And a lot of times, you know, I don't get to do this until, you know, late summer where, you know, I start to have to have to prioritize it just based on how quick the season is coming up on us. Uh, but this year, you know, I've, I've got a little bit more time for obvious reasons. And so I'm kind of, I'm trying to take advantage of that and use it to my benefit. And so, you know, there's nothing really I need to work on from a saddle gear standpoint, like my climbing stuff is all kind of situated, but the ghillie jacket is something new for me. So hunting or shooting from that is a little bit different. Um, given that you got a bunch of stuff and, you know, this one has, you know, uh, uh, like jute and, um, just, you know, fabric on my riser arm. And so I had to spend some time kind of trimming that up to make sure my, I wasn't catching my string in it. Um, whenever, I, you know, when I released my arrow and I was still having some challenges because there was just so much fabric there. Cause I bought a jacket. It's actually a Rancho Safari jacket. If anyone, it's the, the shaggy short is what I ended up getting. Um, and I bought it a little bit big. Actually, I think I bought a medium. I didn't think it was going to be quite that big. Um, but I, I wanted it to be just a little bit bigger. That way, once the colder weather comes in and I've got a little bit more layers on, I wanted to be able to make sure that I could still use that uh, piece of gear whenever I, you know, starting to put some layers on and so forth. So, you know, with that, there's a little bit of extra fabric in on my arm, on my riser arm. And even after I trimmed the fabric back, I was still having some issues with my string when I released my arrow, catching some of that fabric and, you know, sending my, my arrow askew by, you know, inch, two inches, three inches, whatever, whatever it was. And so that's just part of the process of kind of dialing in the, the jacket itself. And so what I kind of decided to do was instead of, you know, one alternative was I was going to literally just cut that, my left arm of that jacket off to up about, you know, my elbow, you know, and I was like, I can just keep my forearm clean and then I would be good. But then I was like, eh, you know, I don't want to do that. It's like, cause you know, for turkey season and stuff like that, it's like, I'd still like to be able to wear it to, to turkey hunt and stuff like that and have it, have the full, the full arm sleeve. And so what I ended up doing was, is <laughs> ask my daughter to bust out her sewing kit and kind of pulled the fabric back underneath my arm and rolled it up to where it's just a little bit tighter and then sewed it in two different spots that way, just to kind of tighten it up around my forearm. And I did that yesterday and it worked like a charm cleaned up my, uh, cleaned up that, that left arm. My string was no longer hitting any of the, uh, any of the, uh, any of the, any of the jacket. And so I think that we're good to go. I actually tested it out today. I'll test it in the saddle just because things kind of bunch up a little bit when you're in the saddle and it's a little bit different. So I'll get into the saddle today and, uh, and give that a whirl, but, uh, that should be all systems go. So, you know, I'm, I'm starting to run out of things to, uh, to, to tweak and update here with all uh, with all the free time that I have. But there's one more thing before we get into the meat of our uh, of our show today, and that's I just want to make mention that you know I've heard a lot of talk and and had have had conversations with you know buddies of mine just talking about the the different hit you know economic hit that you know businesses are taking, organizations are taking, and so forth. Actually, John and I just did an Instagram live uh, podcast, which that'll come out actually next week, um, kind of talking about some of the business challenges. And this doesn't just go for those typical, you know, product product businesses. It also impacts the conservation organizations that are doing a lot of great work on, on our behalf. You know, a lot of them have either missed their national meeting or they've missed conventions that they're a big part of to do their, you know, annual membership kind of drives and so forth. Uh, I, I think also just as, you know, as a natural consequence of what we're seeing happen in the world, you know, economically speaking, is that, you know, there's a lot of folks that, you know, are in, in, in a challenging position when it comes to to finances, um, given given the shutdown and so forth. Um, then there's those of us, I count myself as fortunate that I'm still, you know, gainfully employed. Um, but even still, you know, it makes me, and I'm sure others like me pause, you know, for a moment and really kind of think and scrutinize, you know, what I'm buying and when I'm buying, because I don't know what the next three to six months might hold, hold for me, you know, in, in terms of employment and, and, and my finances, it's just, I can't make any long-term plans or commitments really. Um, so with that, you know, conservation organizations are having the same kind of challenge because they rely on us to, you know, donate or become members or whatever the case might be. And so, you know, for someone like me, it's like, you know, I'm a member of maybe four different conservation groups, four or five that I pay an annual dues to, and I'm happy to as a member. Um, you know, this year might be one of those years where it's like, maybe I can only do two, or maybe I can only do one, or some folks out there, depending on what your situation is, may not just may not be in the cards for this year. And that's completely understandable. And I'm, I'm the last person that likes to tell people what they should do, um, do with their money. Um, but if that's the situation that you're in, you know, there are other ways that, you know, you can, that you can support still. And so, you know, it, it becomes increasingly more important to look at the, you know, the companies you support, the products you buy, 
and what they're doing uh, with their dollars in terms of how they support the things that you think are are important. So, you know, if you're not able to pay, you know, and, and, and be an, a member like maybe you normally are to XYZ, you know, nonprofit organization, look for, you know, products that are supporting those initiatives. You know, for example, you know, Skull Brew Coffee Company does you know, give back to these nonprofit organizations that are, you know, near and dear to a lot of hunters' hearts. And we're not the only one. There's a lot of them out there that are part of 2% for conservation. You know, Exodus Trail Cameras is 2% certified as well, and they're giving back, um, you know, it, 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 to, to support these, uh, you know, organizations as well. Um, so in that spirit, you know, for, for the rest of this month, you know, Skull Brew Coffee is going to do a 15% discount with the promo code TRUTH at checkout. Um, and just as a reminder, we give back 10% of all of our profits to uh, nonprofit conservation organizations. You can you can click which one you would like to your your uh, portion of your proceeds to go to in a drop down menu when you go to check out. And so that is one way that we can all kind of help continue to support conservations by being mindful of those products that we're purchasing um, consistently anyway, as just part of our normal life. Or if there is a purchase you're going to make. Um, you know, just do your due diligence and, and, and make sure that it's supporting the uh, the things that you value. But with that, we're going to go ahead and get ready to jump into our show. I have a cool show for you today. My buddy Brian Broderick is on. He is the owner of Day 6 Specialized Gear. And this is part one of a two-part series. And what Brian and I really talk about in this first part is, um, you know, really just deer hunting uh, in, in all facets. Um, you know, Brian's a pretty, uh, a, a pretty great hunter. Uh, in his own right, um, hunts a lot of different states, uh, kills big mature deer. That's really what he's after, um, and he hunts them in a lot of different ways. We'll talk about a few different ways that, that he that he gets it done. Some of them he would even <laughs> suggest to you that they are not OSHA approved. He also has a really kind of interesting way that he uses decoys, which is interesting to me. Um, as Brian does do some ground hunting in in some of these different states that he hunts, it's 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 required. Um, and he uses a decoy in some of those setups, and that's something that I'm, you know, adding to my repertoire this year as I've talked about ground hunting, and you know, I'm planning to use a decoy in certain setups. And so it was really interesting to get his perspective on how he uses it. So um, the part two will come out in probably like two-ish weeks, and in that one we talk more specifically about arrow building, bow tuning, and just you know, getting getting a flight of good arrow, and the super hot topic of of heavy arrows. But with that, I want to just thank all of you for supporting the podcast and enjoy today's session. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. And on this, uh, I usually don't record these on weekend mornings. This is a nice change of uh, nice change of pace. I got my buddy, Mr. Brian Broderick, on from Day 6 Specialized Gear. We're going to be talking a little bit of hunting, a little bit of arrows, and uh, probably, I mean, it's it's hard to avoid these days. We'll probably talk a little bit of COVID, I'd imagine. But how are you doing this morning? Uh, I'm good. Good, man. It's free and clear. <laughs> free and clear how's uh how are things in how are things in the south man things are a little a little nutty up here with the state of a uh, state of affairs how are you guys doing down there it's um other than really the inconvenience of uh you know just food and restaurants and things like that it's really not uh um really not that big of a difference down here to be honest with you we're not really seeing uh the reaction you know, that, that, um, some of the other States and of course, some of the big cities are experiencing, but yeah, you know, we're, we're pretty good, you know, other than my, both my boys being home and driving my wife crazy. So, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm leaving a little earlier every day and coming home a little later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you were an empty nester and now you are no more, right? And that's what happened. Well, we still had one at home in high school, uh, and then we had one in college, and so they're both out of school and trapped at home. And right. you know, there's there's way too many uh, too many uh, hormones and, and stuff going on there with those guys not right. being able to uh, do what they want to do. They're going stir crazy. Right. So what you're saying is there's 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 daily brother wrestling matches happening. No, no, there would be other than my younger one would thump the older one every time so there's there's that he's tried it once and that was all he needed to know so <laughs> oh man that's good stuff yeah. I, I grew up with a sister so i didn't have the uh the the brotherly wrestling matches i was just telling my daughter stories last night um because yeah. I, I had a bunch of cousins my family's pretty big on my dad's side and there was a lot of a lot of boys and we we're all you know right around the same age and, uh, and she wanted to hear stories from like me growing up and stuff like that. And I was telling her about things like 
we would get into walnut fights and we would shoot each other with pellet guns and run each other with, over with four wheelers and stuff like that. And she's like, dad, you won't even let me walk to the end of the street. And I was like, and for good reason. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny, you know, um, in, on my dad's side of the family for four generations, there's only been one girl born. Really? Yes. It is all just a bunch of dudes. And, uh, you know, I've got a brother, my dad had three brothers, his dad had four brothers, you know, all of my dad's brothers have nothing but boys. I mean, it, it is, it's insane. And so, you know, we grew up with bloody knuckles and, you know, torn clothes, busted lips. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just how we grew up. Yeah. And, you know, literally my boys have never even seen anybody go at it. You really? know, I mean, it's just. Yeah, it's a different world, you know? I mean, we came home every day and pushed our motorcycles down the street, you know, till our parents couldn't hear because we weren't allowed to ride them on the street until we got, you know, to the fields or the woods where we were going to ride. You know, we'd push them down the street until we knew it was far enough our parents couldn't hear, and then we'd, you know, kick them off and terrorize the world. And, I mean, we did that every single day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now, I mean, these kids – they can't even ride their bicycles without a, you know, space helmet on. <laughs> know, it's right? unbelievable how quickly it's changed. I know. Right. It was, I was telling her last yeah. night cause if she was out riding her bike and I, that's kind of what started the whole conversation. Cause I, she was out riding her bike in the, in the driveway and, and, um, and if we would have asked her to go outside and ride her bike, she would have never done it. But because no one asked her, she got it out on her own, just started riding around and, you know, I said to my wife, I was like, you know, she's the only kid I'm seeing like in the neighborhood that doesn't wear a helmet. Now, if we go on long rides, like she'll wear a helmet or whatever. But I was like, I rode four wheelers, ATVs, motorcycles, never had a helmet. I wrecked every single one of them, you know, and she likes to ride ATVs with her one grandfather. And, uh, and I was telling her how I had wrecked the one ATV whenever I was growing up as a kid in this, in the, in the Creek behind the house. And, uh, Basically, it was just racing through the racing through the stream and hit a rock and flipped it, and it landed in a water hole and sunk to the bottom and shut off. So, you know, there you go, water through the engine, which pretty much killed that that machine. And she asked if I got in trouble. She's like, did, you know, do you get in trouble with Pap? And I was like, no. I was like, because he actually sunk one racing on a on a on a frozen pond where it fell through. <laughs> I was like, so I was like, he uh, so he was like, oh, I've been there before. Let's go pull it out and we'll tear the engine apart and and clean it up. So then started the whole like. You know, what was it like then when you were a kid growing up? Like, what all did you do? And I was like, well, there was a lot of fist fights between cousins and uh, a lot of running each other over with motor motorized vehicles. I was <laughs> like, so, but uh, yeah, difference between country living, upbringing, and uh, now living in the suburbs, I guess. Uh, there's no doubt. I mean, we had, uh, we, for our family of four, you know, all four of us had three wheelers. Yeah. I mean, we had a trailer with with four three wheelers stacked at an angle on them um, to get all four of them on there. And I mean, that's everybody had one, my mother, my dad, my, me and my brother. And then, you know, uh, we had four wheelers. I always had motorcycles and uh, you know, it's just, it's a different world. I, I, you know, when I pass these, these um, shops that sell motorcycles and ATVs and things like that, I'm wondering how do they stay in business? Cause I never see a motorcycle on the back of a trailer for somebody to go, you know, riding anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess hunting probably saved them, you know, the introduction of ATVs into hunting, you know? I, yeah. I was just going to say, because like growing up, I never remembered seeing anything that was, you know, motorized for hunting specifically. Like I never used a, 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 an ATV to hunt at all. It was always hiking no. somewhere or whatever. You know, most of the stuff was all geared towards racing whenever I was growing up. And that was partially what we did. It's like, I, I raced go-karts and, you know, I'd race three wheelers from time to time, some ATVs and stuff like that. And that was kind of like what they were all built, built for. And now you look at it and it's big, like trail riding, four wheel drive, you know, 800 CC, you know, four wheelers and, or, you know, UTVs, if you know, that's the other, other kind of side of it or whatever. But I would say, yeah, you're probably right. It's probably like the, you know, introduction into the hunting space. And more recreational versus racing probably is the other, the other big move, you know, getting away from the idea that it's got to be fast and the need to race in order to own one versus just going out and doing some trail riding. Yeah. You know, what's amazing is, is that, uh, especially in the South, um, the reliance on a, on a side by side or electric, you know, UTV or whatever, um, 
the reliance on those for hunting has really become so overwhelming because you, you, no one walks anymore. And, and I do a lot of walking. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, our place in Alabama is about 2000 acres. And I, you know, I may use uh, one of the machines to get like through the pastures or whatever, through some fields and get across maybe a big Creek or something. And then I park it and walk. And the engagement that you have with wildlife and, and figuring out what's happening on your property when you're on foot uh, versus being on a machine, it, it, it's night and day. I think the rewards are tenfold if you'll just walk a little. Um, and then our place out in Oklahoma is really big and we don't even have, um, you know, an ATV or anything out there. I mean, we park the truck and walk and, um, you know, over half of my, you know, big deer, half of all my deer out there in the Midwest, in that area, Oklahoma, Kansas, half of them have been on the ground because I'm walking, you know? Right. Yeah. So I mean, people's reliance on those things has gotten crazy. Yeah, no, I'm I'm the same way. It's like I pretty much walk every. I mean, you know, ninety eight percent of what I hunt is public. You know, we do have <clears throat> some family property that I will get on once in a while. It's main; those are mainly hunts that I do whenever my dad happens to come up from the Carolinas. We got a piece back in our hometown, and I'll y'all you know, hunt that with him <clears throat> him from time to time. But most of them, my hunts are all in public, and that's all predominantly. You know, it's it's one hundred percent walk in walk in access. And I agree with you. I mean, there's a lot of times. You know, if there was, if I were on, you know, an ATV or whatever, kind of scooting through to where I thought I wanted to be, like, for example, this year in Iowa, it's like, I probably would have drove right past sign that ended up leading me to killing the deer that I killed. Um, you know, it's like, I've started adopting more and more of this idea of, um, and I, and I didn't coin the phrase. It was a, a buddy, you know, uh, Zach Farrenball that I kind of picked it up from where he was like, you know, when he goes into hunt, you know, he, he starts off without a place in mind. And I've kind of adopted that to where when I go into hunt a spot, especially like a lot of these public pieces that I might have limited information about, you know, I'm basically walking in and I don't have a preconceived notion of where I'm going to end up. I just find the first hot sign or the first sign that I find and then I determine what direction that should lead me in. And then I go that direction and I just kind of keep going until I find the hot sign that I want to set up on. And then I set up. And a lot of times, you know, when I'm looking at a map before I walk in, I end up somewhere completely different than I thought I would by looking at the map. Um, and I've just found that I've had a lot better encounters that way and, um, you know, sticking arrows and deer at the same time. So, you know, I totally agree with you. I think it's kind of changed. I I do agree. There's a place for it, you know, especially on some public parcels where you want to get through, you know, look, I think the perfect example is my father-in-law's property. It's, it has the worst access on the, on the planet. And I do think using like an ATV or something to drive through the field, to get to your, to the timber, to get in is probably your best bet because those deer, they see tractors and trucks and ATVs all the time. And they, they, they aren't bothered by them. But as soon as you try to walk that entrance, they'll blow every deer out of the field, especially if you're doing a morning hunt, trying to catch them back to bed. Um, so I think that there's a place for them, but you know, I, I agree with you. I think you miss a lot whenever you, when you use those versus walking. Yeah. I'm, you know, my modus operandi in Alabama is basically I I know where a, a, an area of big deer is uh, kind of hanging out, mm-hmm. and um, uh, so just kind of to back up on that, I, I don't put my cameras where I'm going to hunt. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is one thing that I think um, people are using their cameras uh, to their detriment. Uh, is to stick them right where they're going to hunt. Um, cause I'm a firm believer in the first time in, uh, is the best chance to kill a big deer. So all of my cameras, uh, which I run a lot, uh, I, I run a lot and, and I do it more for just trying to find the, the deer I want to try to hunt. But, um, I put my cameras on the roads Hmm. and that's where I, um, you know, try to pick up where a big deer is. I want to, I want to have that camera where there's already going to be, um, traffic, uh, whether it's foot traffic, ATV track or whatever it is, but I want to find that deer away from where I'm going to hunt him. And once I know that there's a big deer in that area, 
that's the time to where when the conditions are right, I'll put my climber on my back. Um, I haven't quite, you know, um, circled back around to the, the, um, harness. What do you call this? The, the, the saddle. Saddle stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, I was actually using a climbing belt and a saddle, um, and a tiny little platform I made myself, uh, back in the early to mid nineties. Wow. Uh, and I used um, uh, a lineman's belt that I modified and, and lineman spikes for climbing, you know, climbing poles, tree, tree spikes. Yep. Um, so where I hunted, you, you couldn't put up stands, they'd get taken or somebody would sit in them. So I basically just made a little steel, steel and wood platform. I used a climbing spike and, um, uh, it, it was basically, it had one strap on it and it basically would turn buckle over. So you'd strap it on, flipped up and then you'd push it down and it would flip over and the bottom spike would stick in the ground. It was sketchy as hell. <laughs> um, and, uh, but that's how I hunted. It was with, you know, climb, you know, tree spikes and, and a climbing belt <laughs> modified to be a harness. And so now I never faced the tree on purpose, uh, always faced away. Um, but you know, I, I do understand the benefit of that, but, but anyway, nowadays I just put a climber on my back and, um, once I know there's a deer in the area, I just slowly move through the property and I kind of know where they're coming and going from where the thickest areas are. I go in there and I find that spot. I think I could kill him here and I go up right there. Right. And that's normally where the big deer get killed is when you're just slipping along, you know, you finally find where you're going to want to be. I mean, it could be seven or eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, but then you go up right there and then same thing, you know, afternoon hunting, uh, is the same way. You know, if I pick up a picture where a deer's crossing a road multiple times and I see what time of day it is, I'll know where, which way to go and, and how to hunt them. And being mobile and, and killing a deer early, uh, in a new spot that you just can't, you can't, I just can't stress enough how, um, how effective that is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's one thing that I'm trying to, you know, for me it, to, to get better at is, um, I guess I should say one of my goals is to start to kill deer earlier in the year. Um, just, I look at guys who are able to get it done in, in that October time frame or earlier in the season, you know, when you really have to know a deer, um, to be able to kill them, you know, I look at those guys that get it done, you know, often in October is like the, the dudes that they they really know their stuff because they're patterning a deer. They figured out where a deer is bedded or multiple deer, whatever the case might be. Sure. And they're making a strategic strike. You know what I mean? It's like, and that for me is something that still is, um, I'm getting better at it. You know, I had a couple of really good encounters last year in October on deer that I knew were in the area. Um, just wasn't able to slip an arrow in, in, in one of them. Um, but you know, last year I was closer. I got dark deered a couple times over some active scrapes and stuff like that. So it was, uh, it was a step in the right, a step in the right direction, but that's kind of a, a goal I have for myself. But speaking of, uh, of killing deer, man, how was, how was your season last year? Did you do pretty good? Yeah, I did. I did pretty good. My, um, my Alabama season was not as, uh, as good as I hoped. Uh, I had pretty much committed to killing one deer. Uh, it's the same deer I've been trying to kill for three years. Hmm. Um, and I've never had one just, you know, throat punch me like this deer has for so long. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and it just, you know, I had him narrowed down to a, basically a hundred yard corridor. Um, but it was a very wind sensitive area. And, uh, it always seemed when I was on the West side of it, he was on the East side of it. And it just, we just played chess back and forth. I had one opportunity at him, um, this year, uh, and just uh, craziest things happened. But anyway, um, I, I didn't get it done. And then the, finally the, a buddy of mine, I brought him in the last week of the season. He's a gun hunter and basically put him on the destination <laughs> right. of where I knew the deer was going every day and he killed him. But nice. it was a six point that scored 142. So Wow. Give you an idea of how big the frame was on that deer. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a that's a good deer, man. Holy smokes, man. That's like that that would be a giant for a for an eight point. Oh, I know, I know. So anyway, um 
uh, anyway, I, um, uh, you know, I killed three bucks in Alabama, but they were pretty much all, uh, like just old gnarly coal bucks, right? You know, nothing, nothing fancy or anything. Just, uh, just cool old deer. That's kind of like the stuff I like to hunt. And, uh, uh, Oklahoma was really good to me. Um, there were bucks that, uh, I had hunted pretty hard last year. So I had kind of had a pretty good historical, uh, you know, data to go by and, and a good starting point. And, I ended up shooting one of them the first afternoon um, from an observation stand. Uh, I, I like to get up real high in some of these places and watch what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of times I'll see a deer that will allow me to, you know, I'll see them bed or where they're bedding and it allow me to try to make a ground move on them and then uh, go from there. But no, I, the first afternoon I got up after I put all my cameras out, it's my first day in, in you know, it, uh, on I just pulled up that morning. I put up, put out about 20 or 30 cameras and then got up about four o'clock and this deer came by me at, you know, four fifteen. So <laughs> it just pure luck. Uh, right. and it was like a one sixty, and, um, and then I didn't hunt for four or five days. I was really working hard on trying to get some of my buddies that were hunting with me, uh, try to get them a deer. And then once they, uh, tagged out, um, I did kind of what we were talking about just a second ago. I knew where this big deer was and I wanted to wait till conditions were right and go in there and try to kill him first, first time in. And, uh, I went in there and right at daylight, I saw him come over the fence and he bedded. Um, and so I waited, you know, for the wind to get steady. And then I got down and I had to make about a mile loop to get around him where I wouldn't be seen number one and number two, uh, where I could, you know, loop around and, and come up, where I needed to be and watch him. And so, uh, you know, I wanted to, I, I wanted, I wanted him, if he got up and I wanted his doe to go left. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if he went left, I had an opportunity, I thought to kill him. And if he went right, I just was going to let him go. Um, and he did get up and go left and, and, uh, I got up and got ahead of him and got to the kind of the ambush point I wanted to be in. And, um, he he followed the doe right through, and I, I use one of those heads up decoys, but I use them a little different. Okay, actually, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about decoying because that's something I'm trying to add to my repertoire this year. So I'm I'm really interested to hear how you how you use this. Well, I, you know, where I'm hunting, it's basically like a lot of CRP. Mm-hmm. So really, the only thing that uh, that you're seeing when you're looking at deer from ground level is just their head and their rat. You're not really seeing their body, you know. Right. And nor can they see other deer except for their head and their rack. So, um, I take the heads up decoy and I unzip my jacket and I slide it like down the back of my collar Mm -hmm. and I put it between my jacket, you know, and my shirt. And then I zip it back up to where I just have, um, the head and the antlers sticking up above my head. Right. And so when I'm crawling, which I spent a lot of time crawling and, in collecting, um, sand spurs, um, <laughs> when I'm crawling, if you can imagine the, the heads up decoy, how it's built, the head and the, and the antlers are, are parallel to the ground. Mm-hmm. So that you really can't see them. So when I'm crawling, I'm not, I don't have anything. I don't have anything that I'm trying to hold in my hand or push forward. Cause I'm already having to deal with the bow. Um, this thing's in, in my jacket, but it's, it's not being seen. Uh, and then I can crawl up to the spot I want to get and I can stay low and crouch down. And when the deer are, when they, when they're getting into range, like this deer, the doe came across this little cut lane, little mode lane. And, you know, I was already raising up. So when I raised up, she saw, all she saw was the head of the rat coming up out of the grass, like a buck standing up. Right. And she, saw it and then took three or four steps forward and just was frozen looking. And then the buck stepped out at 25 yards behind her. And he immediately saw where she was looking, looked, saw the head in the rack and started laying his ears back to fight. And the arrow was through him. So that has been incredibly effective for me. It 
frees up my hands to just operate with my bow. You don't have to clip anything on the front of your bow. And the type of stuff I hunt, they're not going to see more than that anyway. Right. So there's no reason to have just anything but the head and the and the rack. And then when you come up on your knees to shoot, it's actually the perfect height to where that's what they're seeing. Uh, so it, it, it really masks your movement because you're kind of modeled by the grass and all or whatever cover you have. And then the, you know, the head and the rack is holding them. The other thing that I'll do, especially when I have a deer that there's no way um, I can make an approach on them because of their location. Mm -hmm. And so what I'll do is uh, I'll make sure that I, you know, uh, downwind of them. Um, and I love to have, um, I love to have the sun at my back as long as the deer or I'm trying to lure a deer to me. Um, I don't ever want the sun at my back if I'm trying to approach a deer and make a stalk, especially people don't consider the, the topo either. So if you're higher and you got the sun at the higher than a deer and you got the sun at, at your back and you're moving in on them, your shadow is going to, you know, they're going to see your shadow before, you ever get within range if you're above them. Right. Imagine, you know, like when you're sitting in the stand and the sun's coming through and you see that little disturbance of light. Yeah. You know that that's an animal and deer moving and it's nothing that you can see other than you see a disturbance of that light pattern. And that's what these deer are seeing. They're seeing that shadow, that disturbance. So if you're above them, you know, it's, it's, and you're moving in on them, it's, it's a disadvantage, but if you're below them and you're moving in, and they hear something or see and they turn and that sun is straight in their eyes. It really gives you that that second extra second or two that you need. But with regards to if there's not an approach and let's say you can get within, say, 60, 70 yards of them, I'll get to a point to where I can get myself in a place to where my body is really covered well uh, by grass or depression or a plum thicket or something. And then just where the head and the and the antlers are showing um, and and literally um, I'll, I'll get there and try to get that sun to my back. And the only thing that I ever do is I just start slowly raking a tree, hmm. uh, not with even an antler, you know, just a broken off stick or right. whatever. It doesn't matter. But just start raking a tree and snapping a few limbs just to get the deer to turn his head. You know, I'm not snort wheezing. I'm not calling. I'm not doing any of that stuff, which sometimes it is very effective, but it's like a kind of a 50 50 deal, you know? Right, right. Um, but when you're raking a tree or breaking a limb, it gets their attention. It sounds like a deer raking. They'll look, and then when they see just that head and the antlers moving, normally, if it's, if you're hunting the right buck and it's kind of the boss buck in the area, um, He'll, he'll get up and start coming to you. Um, and the beauty of that is, is that a lot of times when they get within range, they almost, you know, they almost turn completely broadside and start sidewalking to you with their hair all puffed up and their yeah. ears back. So they almost turn broadside to you, you know? Um, and so that's been super effective for me. I'd probably rather, I'd rather shoot a 140 on the ground than a 160 out of the stand. I, I love ground hunting. Right. That's awesome, man. Cause that's one of the things this year, um, that I, it's, every year I try to pick something that I'm going to get better at. Right. And hunt, hunting in October is like one of them, but from a tactics <clears throat> perspective, you know, <clears throat> this past year, and I've mentioned this a couple of times on the podcast, so I'll just kind of give the cliff notes version. I had a great deer that I've kicked up in, in Iowa in a CRP field. There was, he was in a, a small draw that I kicked him out of, um, that was just like a hedgerow almost. And, uh, there was no trees to get into. And so I ended up hunting him from the ground the next day, trying to catch him on coming back to bed the following morning. And, uh, he never showed up. I ended up rattling a smaller buck in that I passed, but I ended up abandoning that deer. And he was, you know, I don't want to put inches on him cause I'm, you know, I don't, I don't exactly know, but he was probably, you know, Boone and Crockett. He was definitely over 170 inches. He was a giant deer. And right. my buddy was like, you know, why aren't you continue to hunt that, uh, you know, hunt that deer. I was texting him, you know, after the hunt. 
And I was like, cause I feel like I'd be hunting a ghost. I was like, cause my ground game, I just don't have confidence in it. You know, I was like, and I feel like I'd be screwing up just about every hunt and, you know, chasing, chasing a ghost at some point. And so I abandoned it, you know, end of the stories. I, I did finally get an arrow and a deer, but, um, that was the thing that told me that, Hey, you need to work on your ground game. Cause you need to be able to be multiple whenever you walk into a place, especially whenever you, you know, for me, whenever I'm walking into public that I may or may not be that familiar with, if the ground setup is where I'm need to be to kill deer, then I need to be able to be comfortable hunting from the ground. And so yeah. that, that's the thing that I'm adding this year is that, do you use any type of ghillie suit or you, you just go in with your normal no. camo? No, no, I, 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 uh, no, I just, I use my normal camo, which I'm not, I don't really wear much camo anyway. So that, I guess that really doesn't matter. But, um, you know, my thing is, is, is I want to utilize natural cover, natural depressions, the, the stuff that they're used to seeing. I, I don't, I don't like the ghillie suits because they, to me, I, I know it looks really good to us, but if you look at a guy in a ghillie suit, it's a big blob. It's a big dark blob. Right. Um, and I don't want to create a large profile. I don't want to increase uh, my profile or anything like that. I, I, I like lighter color clothes mm -hmm. um, over dark. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, that helps uh, diminish your outside profile and outline. Um, and, you know, as far as ground hunting goes, you know, I, I got a couple of basic things. Number one, you know, um, if there's not any wind, it's not, I don't even consider it. So, like, there'll be days to where I'll just say I'm 100% going to be hunting from a stand today. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to make a move on a deer, even if I see one, because that's the quickest way to run a deer out of a place mm -hmm. is, is, is going to him and pushing him a few times. Uh, and sometimes the big deer is just once. And so, you know, what I like to do is, is, you know, I'll see what the conditions are that day. Um, if it's going to be windy and I've got good, good cover noise and a steady wind, uh, I'll hunt somewhere. Um, let me back up. So if I've got a big deer kind of targeted and I know he's in the area, I'll have multiple locations that I'll go climb up. Um, you know, it's not ever going to be just one stand. Right. So a lot of times if I've got a, you know, a good clear day and it's going to be good and windy and steady, uh, I'll get in a stand where I can see a lot of country and see a lot of ground. And, that way I'm basically getting up there to observe and hoping that I see that deer push your doe into a little depression or into a plum thicket or something like that. Uh, even if I see one, just, you know, a glimpse of one, I, I, the, if the conditions are right, I have no problem hopping down and running forward and getting up on another observation point to get eyes on that deer. And I'll basically just stay back two or 300, four, three, 400 yards, whatever, and just watch them until they stop. And then when they stop, you know, I'll evaluate where they are and it's either a go or no go. Mm -hmm. So if they're in a spot where I think I can slip in and kill them and, and them not know I'm there, 100%, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to alert them, but if they're in a spot where I can say, okay, well, I can get to that ditch or that little drainage that's maybe only three feet lower than where they are and it's 80, a hundred yards, you know, then I know I can get there. And then I've got the, you know, the heads up in my jacket, in the back of my jacket. So those are two of the, the, the strategies I use, but if the conditions aren't right, I just don't consider it. You right. know, uh, if the conditions are bad, as far as stand hunting goes, and you've got a really weak wind, it, a lot of times I won't even hunt if it's like warm and, not a steady wind. That's the fastest way to just completely burn a spot. Um, right. But if I do have a, a weak wind and it's not great conditions, I'm always looking, I'm always looking for an option to go hunt where I've got kind of what I call a backstop. Mm -hmm. Um, and so let's say that, that, uh, that I've got, um, I'm on the edge of a, of a, a big wheat field, but there's kind of a, a hedge row and thicket that runs along one side of it. And I know deer use that. 
you know, I'll, I'll hunt that to where, you know, 60% of the swirling wind conditions are going to be putting, uh, my, my wind out in that wheat field in the morning where they're not going to be, they're going to be coming, you know, in the thick stuff. Uh, and I'm trying to, you know, play the averages where the majority of the, of the wind direction is going to put my wind out where they're not going to be. Um, I, I do the same thing. Like, uh, if I'm hunting along the river, Mm -hmm. um, I'll find a spot where I like to hunt, where I can have my wind dumping out into the river because you know, let's, let's say you've got like a Southwest wind at, at three is what the forecast is. Mm -hmm. That's basically telling you that shit's coming from everywhere all day and you're just going to get <laughs> screwed over right? and all you're going to hear is deer blow. So basically I'll say, okay, well, you know, it's good, definitely going to have south in it today. It's definitely going to have some west in it. May even have a little bit of east. So, you know, if if I can get basically um, everything, any, any any of those three directions, if I can get on the south, you know, the south side of the river and have basically everything dumping onto the river, that's the kind of place I want to hunt where I've got a backstop where I know deer are going to come swimming down the river. Right. And smell, you know? Yeah. So that's super important. If I don't have something like that, I want to hunt, you know, that's a lot of times where I'll just go get somewhere and watch. Right. Um, a lot of guys feel like they need to hunt all the time. And I understand that because they have limited time. But if you're forcing it and going in to where a really big deer is and you've got swirling winds and virtually no winds and bad conditions, you're just lowering your chances of ever really actually having the opportunity to kill that deer. Right. Uh, and so I, that, that's, that's kind of how I make my decision every morning. And then I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of times where it's just too damn cold. Right. And I know I'm not going to be able to sit in a stand, you know, for four or five hours. If it's, you know, below 10 or whatever, and it's windy at that point, you know, I'm going to go get some where I can see, and, uh, and try to pick up a deer, you know, that's going to go get in a little plum thicket in the sun and, and try to do a ground deal. Cause yeah. I've just not had a lot of success, um, killing real big deer with my bow, uh, when it's super, super cold and I'm completely frozen, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. That's one of the things this year that I kind of ad adopted was, yeah, you know, that when I was when I was in Iowa, we had a really really cold, hard cold snap where I was walking into the timber some mornings and it was like minus ten, minus fifteen with like the wind chill and stuff. It was pretty brutal. It was the same thing where it's like you know just the way I like to hunt kind of played nicely into that because I would go sit in the morning, wait for morning movement, and it would usually be about ten o'clock. I would start to get cold to the point where I'm like, I need to move, and so then I would just get down and I would scout until i found hot sign again later you know and it, it warmed me up on my walk and then i would set up for the evening you know and and sit for you know however long i could tolerate sitting you know for that hunt and then if i got cold again i'd get down and move and try to find you know hot sign yet again and that was kind of you know it's uh it, it played nicely i guess the strategy played nicely into like the, the the cold weather kind of what you're saying it's it's uh you know, the ability to move, um, not only benefits you and being able to make a move on a deer when you do find one, or, you know, when you find the right sign, but can also kind of play into kind of keeping things moving as far as like the cold temperatures and stuff like that, which is nice. Yeah. Um, you know, I, one of the things I think that, um, has, has been a, a, a real realization for me, uh, that would, possibly be helpful to people is that you know you can kill big deer in timber i mean it certainly happens they certainly live there um but i've just learned over the years that we're where a big deer is going to spend most his time uh on his feet are these like lower brushy areas mm -hmm. um real thick real dense low brushy stuff it doesn't have a lot of big timber in it um basically anywhere that is almost impossible to put a stand yeah um is where i have found my biggest deer and you know i've just learned to adapt to that now you, you, the, the, 
the the thing is is that it's very difficult to hunt those deer from the ground there and if you could get a little elevation uh you would just be so far ahead of the game and those deer seem to be way more relaxed in places like that yeah and basically it's just real ugly places yep uh, big, big deer live in ugly places and so you know one of the things that i've incorporated uh over the last i don't know 10 years or so when i started hunting some of these like lower wet flat just brushy you know bushy type spots is you know i'll find like where there's um uh say like a you know a little group of you know 12 14 15 foot tall cottonwoods or um some type of little you know shrubby type trees and they're really thick on the top but they're too small to get a tree stand in you know Mm -hmm. and so what i've gone to do doing which has been super effective for me is i you know I'm, i'm like i'd love to get up there because it's so bushy you have such cover and such backdrop they would just never see you um but the trees are too small. So what I've been doing is taking ratchet straps and basically ratcheting, you know, a group of, you know, little (laughs) three and four inch, two inch saplings and trees. I ratchet them together um, and basically make a tree uh, and, and and then hang my, my lock on in that. And, um, and let me just say that I do a lot of sketchy shit in a tree stand I shouldn't do. <laughs> uh, and I'm certainly not condoning this or saying this is safe and this is what you should be doing because it's not. I'm an idiot when it comes to doing the things I do in trees. Um, it's not OSHA approved is what you're saying. No. Like some of the cottonwoods we hunt in out in Oklahoma are so big, uh, but they'll be like, uh, say, a, a 12 inch limb that'll go out 20 feet parallel to the ground, Mm -hmm. you know, way out over the ground, but halfway out, there'll be a a six inch limb that goes straight up and it's perfect for a lock on. And so where most people would put, try to put the stand in the trunk, it's hard to shoot out of those big trees. But if, if you kind of balance beam and walk out that limb 10 feet and then hang your stand on that little, you know, upright that's out there. Now you're out towards the edge of the tree and you're not obstructed by all the limbs. So I do stupid crap like that all the time. (laughs) But, but what I do with these, these little brushy deals is I'll take ratchet straps in and I'll ratchet strap, say the first ones, say it, say four feet off the ground. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then once I get it super tight, I'll, I'll basically reach up, grab the tree and I'll jump up, like put my foot on what my left foot on halfway up, and then I'll put my right foot on the strap. Mm-hmm. You know, where there's a gap between two of the little trees with the strap, and I use the strap as a step. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll put another strap on like three or four feet up and um ratchet it tight and then do the same thing where I'm basically standing on the webbing of the strap. And then I'll get myself up about twelve feet, and then once you ratchet in at, at the top you know you can ratchet the tops of those things in really tight because it's the smaller parts of the trees but then you actually get a pretty dead gum stable platform to put your stand on and you know these are not things that you're going in and like limit up shooting lanes and trimming trees you're basically saying this is a highway stomped out in mud 20 yards in front of me the wind's perfect These deer are coming out of this marsh or this brush thicket. I'm getting one shot to that one spot right there. I'm not worried about what's behind me to my left to my right. I'm completely concealed in this brushy group of trees. And I'm taking that one shot. And this is what I'm setting up for that one shot. Yeah. Um, And you find those places all the time when Mm -hmm. you're scouting where you're going, God, man, if there was a tree in here, I could own this place. Yeah. Um, And so that's kind of what I do. Um, yeah. not OSHA approved and not day six endorsed. So <laughs> right. Don't sue me. Right. Yeah. It, it's, it's funny. Cause I found a bunch of those spots this year in the off season here scouting just because I was looking through a different lens, knowing that 
you know, planning to do more hunting from the ground and stuff like that. And it's exactly what you're talking about. It's, you know, it's, you know, you, you don't find these, these mature deer in these pristine kind of hardwood settings. They may pass through at some point if they're going to like a, a food source or maybe during the rut, if you've got a good pinch point to where they're, you know, going from doe bedding area to doe bedding area or whatever the case might be. But just to catch one, you know, out and about at 10 o'clock in the morning in October, it's probably not going to happen. You know what I mean? So you got to kind of get up in their business. And uh, I found a couple spots like that this year scouting where it's just here. It's more clear cuts on the side of mountains here on, on some public land. And, you know, those clear cuts get pretty nasty thick. And so it's more working your way into the middle of that, trying to find a way into it because they actually like to bed. And, you know, especially bucks, I found buck beds in the middle of these in the middle of these clear cuts. Um, what I've kind of found and I've talked about it a couple of times or just mentioned it. I kind of I call them mountaintop swamps where it's like you just find a small area of water ingress. And it kind of, especially yeah. if it's on, if it's on the side of a mountain where it kind of flows into the clear cut and then eventually that clear cut will get a flat spot and that's where the water will kind of pull up and it may not be holding water per se, like, you know, as far as like, you know, three feet of water or whatever, but it's just wet enough to where trees couldn't grow and swamp grass does. And that's actually where I've found buck beds. And so that's kind of been one of my things for a high pressure state like PA is I find those little water ingresses into clear cuts and I'll follow those into where in the middle of this clear cut that might be five football fields big all of a sudden boom in the middle of it it opens up to where now there's like deer highways running through there because they're completely safe in there and no one's getting in there if anybody is hunting it they're hunting the edges of it um and so they're completely left alone in there and so i found a handful of those spots this year that uh here and there you'll find a tree close enough that you could get into but for the most part it's going to be like what you're saying where it's like you either have to kind of make something or you're going to have to hunt it from the ground so well that 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 little system that I've been using has been um, uh, it, it's been super effective. I, I can tell you that it's uh, I mean it's contributed to me really uh, you know killing some pretty big deer. Um, and it's just stuff that people don't think about, you know. And yep. and I mean I get it. I mean it's it's it sounds stupid. Um, and I'm sure climbing up in trees with your feet on ratchet straps is stupid. Um, but that's just, that's just what I do. Right. Um, I think the moral of the story though, is that you have to be, you have to think differently than, than everyone else. And you got to do the things that other people aren't willing to do, you know, it's in certain areas in order to have the opportunities that you're looking for. I, I mean, I think that's really what it comes down to. It is. I mean, you know, most of the guys that I hunt with, um, they go to the same stands. Mm-hmm. They, um, you know, they hunt the same things over and over. They uh, really don't pay a whole lot of attention uh, to what time of day they're getting pictures. They, they don't pay attention to what direction the deer's moving. Um, you know, they're putting their cameras right on top of where they're hunting. Um, it, it just, it's just all of these things that they're just not really paying attention to details. And so, you know, I, I, I have a lot of success every year because I'm basically paying attention to every indicator I'm getting, but I'm also reacting quickly. You know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, thinking, man, what should I do? You know, I mean, once I know that there's a big deer in that area, there's normally a stand on my back and, you know, I'm, I'm moving around ready to put up the stand when I feel like I found that, 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 you know, point that I can intersect with that deer and, and, you know, have everything in my favor. And so, and sometimes, honestly, sometimes let's say that, that you've, you know, honed in on a big deer and you're, and you're trying to, you know, figure out where to kill him. Sometimes the best spot you find where he's like, man, where you're like, man, I know I can get, could get him here. Sometimes there's not really a setup there. You know, there's, there's, you, the best signs not always where there's somewhere to set up under any circumstance. So you've just got to be able to be comfortable with the fact that you're going to move to the second best location. You know what I mean? Right. Um, some people try to force it. And when I say there's not a good setup, let's say that there is some trees there. Okay. But the trees are straight up bare, no cover, no nothing. Just because you're in a tree, does it mean that that's the best place to be? Right. Um, I am a firm, firm, 
firm believer in having a very dense backdrop. Um, what I love in the South is we have magnolia trees. Um, early season, they suck because the, the leaves lay on the ground and hold water and the mosquitoes love to, right. you know, breed, breed there. But, but like a, a magnolia has this just incredible dense backdrop, thick green leaves, these giant green rubber leaves, and they're there year round. So you have this incredible, you know, opportunity to get up there and I mean, you could do whatever you want to do and you're not going to get pinched. Same thing with cedar trees. I mean, cedar trees were made for killing deer because you can get up there and just nibble out just a spot for you uh, and leave that cover around you to where basically you're, you're, you're totally encased except for, you know, basically your waist up. Right. Um, I'm just a firm believer in that. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, usually you only get one opportunity at a really big deer and it's one thing to get him with rain and within range. It, it, a lot of people get big deer within range. The difference is, is the guys that seal the deal. Yeah. Um, you get in range and you start to draw and you get pinched. Well, it's over. Um, and, and even if the deer doesn't blow, um, blow out when he sees you, if he freezes and locks on you immediately as a bow hunter, your adrenaline goes through the roof. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a, it is a panic button spike, you know, in adrenaline. Um, and then the deer's adrenaline goes through the roof. So now <laughs> if you get pinched and the deer's still there, you're not operating, you know, at your, at your best. And then the deer is ready to move as soon as that bow goes off. And, you know, that cuts your, your percentage of success chances in half, you know? Right. So I'm just a firm believer in having that backdrop being as, as hidden as you can. I'm happy to sacrifice some shooting lanes to make sure that my primary kill zone is totally protected. And, and I feel like I'm totally covered, you know? Yeah. No, I, does that I, make sense? No, it totally doesn't. And I actually operate the same way. I, I definitely know guys who, you know, are looking, you know, they're, if they have a deer somewhere, they want enough shooting lanes and enough clearance where they can get a shot at any, any spot. And I get it. And some of those guys are killing good deer. I fall under more of the school of thought that you do where, you know, I really want the, I want the opportunity that I think is the most high percentage chance it's going to happen. And then everything else I want to be covered up if I can, because I, I don't want to be seen and I don't want to get caught in, at the moment of truth, whenever I'm drawing or getting ready to release or whatever the case is, I can live with not getting the shot because I didn't have a shooting lane. What I can't live with is screwing it up because I was I was in a spot where I left myself wide open and vulnerable and didn't even get a shot opportunity. Like that would bother me more than not having the shot opportunity because I didn't trim a lane. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. So, but you know what? It, and I'll be honest with you. I, I know this is going to sound crazy as well, but um. You know, I, I very rarely, I, I mean, I really don't, I, I don't, I don't trim shooting lanes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in, uh, in, um, keeping it as natural as possible. Um, firm believer in, um, uh, just keeping it, you know, undisturbed. And, and the reason I say that, I guess, is because. You know, I've seen so many deer come into a spot where stuff has been trimmed out. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like they're like, when they get in there, they just, it's almost like they just kind of stop and go, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a second. Yeah. Wait, whoa, wait a second. This isn't, this isn't the way it was, you know? Right. And even if you trim them in the spring, I've noticed when deer come to those places, um, Gosh, they just seem to be in a different, um, uh, I guess what you'd say temperament, Yeah. you know, they're, they're, when they come in somewhere like that, they, it's almost like, okay, now we're going in where they where, where the hunters have been. Yeah. Now we're going into where it's been disturbed and they don't come through there naturally. So for me, when I get, get up in a tree, you know, I, I do a lot of looking from the ground before I pick a tree and where I'm going to get. 
and you know i put myself in a position where i'm looking and i can just from doing it a long time i can tell hey there's going to be plenty of opportunities to shoot and then when i get up you know i may adjust my stand around on the tree a, a few degrees to open up more holes through the canopy if you will to get spots and i'd rather have one get through there in an undisturbed place and have another opportunity with him than have a place all cut to hell and then the deer never come through there. Yeah. No. Uh-huh. So, Go ahead. No, that, that's it. Yeah. I was just going to say that I, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, especially for me hunting as much public as I do, most of the times I don't have an opportunity to trim cause it's for the most part illegal. And so if I do trim any, it's usually on a, you know, a family property or whatever, but I've just grown so used to not being able to, that I just, that I, that I don't. And I think the one thing that people need to remember, especially if you're trying to hunt close to bedding or places where they're spending a lot of time, that would be like their, their home area, if you will, you know, imagine someone comes into your house and your living room and takes and, and moves the lamp three feet to the left. Like you're going to notice that immediately. Like, Whoa, why'd that lamp move? You know, it's the same thing with deer. It's like, you're walking into their house and if, whenever you're trimming stuff, it's like, it might not seem like a big deal to you, but for someone who lives there every day, right. It's like that, that, that is noticeable. And it's like moving your lamp or they moved your TV to the other side of the room. You know, it's like, and so you're just teeing them off and and putting them on edge. If, if nothing else, that something has changed and that they need to be, you know, they need to be on their game a little bit more than maybe they would have been if they were coming through and things were as, as they, as they should be. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. If you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and be sure to subscribe the podcast and head over to youtube as well and check out we've got a couple videos i've put out there'll be a few more coming and uh, make sure you subscribe to the youtube channel as well before we shut this thing down i need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible tethered exodus outdoor gear skull brew coffee company and gum leaf usa boots and until next time we'll see y'all